hello Daniel Ellsberg. Hello, it's, good uh, morning. It's a, it's a pleasure to uh, to talk to you and thanks for you know making the time actually to to, to talk to me and and answer a few questions. Um, mm -hmm. In 1971, with uh, your colleague at the Rand Corporations, you released the Pentagon Papers, which you know they became known as the Pentagon Papers. Um, I was wondering if WikiLeaks or an organization such as WikiLeaks had existed at the time, how things could things have been different? Would things have been different, you think? Yes, they, they could well have been different. I actually copied the papers in order to give them to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in the first instance, which I did do in 69, uh, almost two years before I gave them to the New York Times. And they repeatedly uh, were ready to use them and then backed off a couple, two or three times, actually, encouraged me to think they would be about to come out. And I did think that was the best place for them to come out because they could hold hearings and swear in witnesses uh, on oath and confront them with these documents and ask questions. Uh, so I thought that was the best channel for uh, raising these issues about history. But they did back off, and I got very discouraged with them. I wasn't really confident the New York Times would ever come out with them because of the classified nature. Uh, and I might well have gone, if WikiLeaks had existed, I certainly would have considered uh, giving them to WikiLeaks at that point when I got discouraged with the uh, Senate ever, uh, ever holding hearings. And <clears throat> then when I did give them to the New York Times, uh, Neil Sheehan, for reasons that remain somewhat mysterious, chose not to tell me that they were going ahead with them. And uh, he risked, in other words, my giving them to somebody else at that time. And in fact, I did deal with other uh, senators and with a representative to get them out in Congress. I didn't think any other newspaper was likely to print them at length, which, of course, WikiLeaks would be perfect for doing. Uh, if they had existed in digital form, if we could scan them at that point. At that point, these were all hard copy. So Xeroxing them was a very long process, and it, you ended up with 7,000 pages uh, of a document. But digitally, uh, of course, that would be uh, nothing. So uh, yes, uh, in terms of waiting for the times, I would not have waited as long as I did. I didn't think they were coming out at all until the very day uh, that they were going to uh, publish them. So, uh, and I would have said that since, people have asked me that since, what would I ask, urge people to do now? And I still would say that a combination of Congress and the press, uh, not just the press in general, but the New York Times, the Washington Post, one or two of the major national papers, uh, would be probably it'd get the most attention at first. Uh, in terms of printing large amounts of material. And I would try those first, but if they delayed, as was often the case, uh, I would then give them to, uh, to WikiLeaks. Uh, conceivably, you could start, you could start with WikiLeaks. Uh, people have had some bad luck with other channels uh, being found out. And uh, so, yes, uh, the fact that it does still exist uh, is, is uh, worthy, I think, is uh, is a good thing. Uh, I work on a, a group called the Freedom of the Press Foundation, which I helped to found with uh, John Perry Harlow. And uh, they actually were started in order to channel money to WikiLeaks uh, at a time when the, thanks to government influence, uh, nearly all the funding channels had been cut off. Uh, that's I think that's not true now. But uh, we managed to get money to them. So I think that answers your question. Uh, the fact that it is there uh, makes it available when the rest of the media back off. Thanks, Daniel. You, you, were, you were prosecuted with the Espionage Act. Um, yes. When, did I you, was the when, first one. I yeah. was the first one to be uh, prosecuted under that act. Uh, we don't have an official secret act as Britain does, because our war of independence from Britain resulted in a First Amendment, which they don't have, uh, which forbids Congress to pass 
any law abridging freedom of speech or freedom of the press or establishing uh, religions. And uh, most countries don't have that with respect to the press, uh, even now. So in theory, uh, there shouldn't be any law which uh, can limit this. The question is, is the Espionage Act, uh, the way the Supreme Court looks at it, uh, acceptable as an abridgment of free speech in the sense of being narrowly constructed and, and just for a purpose that Congress endorses, such as to a very limited degree libel in this country or obscenity? Uh, or espionage, for that matter? And the answer is no. It definitely is not a constitutionally acceptable uh, substitute for an official secrets act. And a British-type official secrets act, which most countries have, would clearly be unconstitutional, criminalizing any and all release of any classified information, uh, information that the government wants to keep from others, uh, usually from the American public above all, or our allies, and to a small degree from enemies. Uh, very, uh, very little of it actually uh, requires protection from foreigners. A lot of it requires protection from political rivals in the US, other agencies, or Congress, which controls the budget. So a lot of that information, in other words, must be out, should be out, and is wrongfully held. My trial did not result in either a verdict or an, uh, an opinion because governmental crimes were discovered right toward the end, uh, just before it went to the jury, that led to the uh, dismissal of the trial and the charges against me. And really, there wasn't another case for another 10 years or so, and, uh, and one after that three and all before President Obama. But then President Obama brought about nine such cases, and Trump did the same in his first term. So uh, there is an increasing use. The use against Julian Assange is the first time that they've used that act against, which is intended for spies, giving secret information secretly to a foreign power, especially an enemy in wartime. And uh, Julian's case is the very first one they've used it against a journalist, as opposed to a source like me, a former official who has possession of the material and shares it with someone. So <clears throat> it's a blatant violation of the First Amendment, and really there wouldn't be much left in this broad, undefined area known as national security, which can cover almost anything that the, government, the president chooses. Uh, in terms of restricting information, you know, it would be, essentially be rescinded. Our war of independence would have failed in that in that respect. And really, the next step would be to use it against people who simply read the material or receive the material, which uh, is in the Espionage Act. Uh, actually, it's written in such a way that uh, it can be used in non-espionage cases such as mine. They didn't, they didn't charge me with being a spy. It's a non-espionage use. It can, the wording of it can be used against anybody who receives the material. That can be in the media uh, when the source gives it to them. Uh, and anybody, by the way, who holds it and possesses it and does not return it to a proper authority. Now, President, former President Trump is being uh, investigated right now for that uh, violation of the uh, wording of the act, and President Biden is subject to it right now, and they found classified material in his possession. Now, in the case of President Trump, he resisted turning over that material when it was specifically demanded, and uh, is therefore comes more clearly under the act. But just to show the ridiculous breadth of this act uh, with respect to in a country that wants to be a democracy or a republic without a monarch who decides uh, everything uh, in the way of information that can be put out, uh, I revealed that I had possessed and had not given it to authorities a top secret document about the Taiwan Straits crisis of 1958 in which we came very close to nuclear war. And I put that out just a year ago uh, through the New York Times 
uh, Charlie Savage on the New York Times, who could have been charged uh, just the way, same way Julian Assange was. And for that matter, anyone at the Times or their readers could have been charged. Uh, and I made a point of that just recently to, to show that uh, how unconstitutional this application of the act actually is. They didn't question me or do anything about that. So just to make the point a little stronger, uh, I in revealed in an interview with the BBC just a month or two ago that I had possessed all of the material that Chelsea Manning had given to Julian Assange before Assange gave it to the newspapers. He conveyed it to me as a backup uh, in case his material was seized in some way or there was a, a foul up there. And uh, I didn't have to put it out because the newspapers did. But I am therefore as prosecutable by the standards of the defense of the Justice Department with which I disagree. Uh, but by their standards, I am as subject to prosecution as any of the people they have uh, prosecuted or as Julian Assange themselves. And the reason I raised this was um, that uh, if he's not to be the subject of selective prosecution, uh, which he is, actually, um, but if it isn't to be blatant, uh, they can uh, bring the prosecution against me uh, along with him. and. Uh, I will certainly not make a plea bargain uh, with the Justice Department. They can't really threaten me as they have others with life imprisonment as they do uh, the other people, which gets them to admit to a lesser charge, because life imprisonment doesn't mean the same for me as it did 50 years ago when I was charged with it, and I risked that anyway at the time. So we'll try to take this to the Supreme Court and get them at last to rule on this, which they have never done. Thanks, Daniel. So that'll be my last question. You've you've recently said, um, I am Julian Assange, and you've in a way explained this now, but I wanted to ask you, what does the persecution of Julian means to all of us, uh, journalists, oh, yes. citizens? <laughs> we, even if he were, and American citizens, this would be unconstitutional. And it is with respect to him also. That applies to the United States. But actually to uh, try to extradite uh, an Australian who is in Britain in custody at this time and who gave his information to Le Monde, uh, El Pais, uh, the British Guardian as well, um, is, and uh, what was it, uh, Der Spiegel in Germany, uh, means that our Justice Department feels uh, justified in trying to extradite any journalist in the world, anywhere, in any newspaper, um, and conceivably any reader. Yes, we do get into a ridiculous area there. Anyone who holds the information, including holding a newspaper that has acknowledged that they're presenting classified information. And... Uh, they could do it. Obviously, they're not going to do that to everyone. They can select who they want uh, as a scapegoat for this charge anywhere in the world. So this puts a bullseye on the back of any journalist that uh, that uh, has the courage, actually, to print information that the American government does not want told to its own citizens or to its allies or to anyone in the world. The information such as Chelsea Manning revealed through Le Monde, uh, in this case, we've gotten it from Assange, about our knowledge of the corruption of Ben Ali in Tunisia, which uh, everyone knew that uh, Ben Ali was corrupt. They didn't know that the American government fully acknowledged that in their support of him. And that revelation implied that they could resist Ben Ali, as they did nonviolently, without being assured that the American government would oppose them. It would be embarrassing for the American government to support this man, which they themselves knew was both corrupt and tyrannical. So there was a revelation that didn't affect the U.S. particularly, but uh, did in fact lead to a nonviolent overthrow of a tyrant in Tunisia. And um, 
that would certainly be uh, be subject to extradition on that point by the U.S. government if Julian Assange continues to be uh, the effort continues to extradite him and to prosecute him. No, no journalist in the world is safe from that, whether they are protected by a First Amendment or not. They're not protected even in the U.S. anymore with this prosecution. Even uh, if, it, if it ends, the, uh, the very fact that it has occurred is, a, as they say, a cooling effect. That is a freezing communication uh, on matters of great public importance. So there's already been a cost. But if public uh, protest can lead to dropping this extradition, as President Biden should do, yesterday, today, tomorrow, uh, that will at least clear the way for uh, honest investigative journalism. Huge thanks, Daniel. Um, many thanks uh, okay. again for, for taking the time to do this.